That gospel this evening is certainly one in which there is much tension and anger and patience. Those three things all went together there. Jesus was back home in Nazareth at the time and he goes in the synagogue and he speaks there and he talks about that he is the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament, particularly those of Isaiah. And so he refers to those and he says very, very clearly that that is uh, who he is and what he is about. And then he goes on and he confronts them and says, you know, I'm not going to do whatever you want me to do here. I'm not just going to do your bidding. And that's when they got angry because he spoke truth to them with love. But he spoke the truth. He spoke who he was, who was in, what his work was to be. And he spoke with love, but he wasn't accepted. And I think that can be a consolation for us as well, that there's so often that we want to speak the truth. We want to invite, we want to challenge, and even to do it with love, but it doesn't seem very effective. Because people so often will close themselves off from truth. And they will choose error rather than truth. And sometimes we can feel helpless in that. I know of so many parents and grandparents who mentioned to me that their son or grandson or granddaughter no longer goes to church, no longer practices their faith. And they say, you know, I try to tell them and I try to talk to them about how important it is and how beautiful our Catholic faith is and how it is really so crucial. And we, ca we cannot put that aside, but they don't listen. And I think back to what Jesus said there, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. That so often with family members, we can only be a good example and pray very hard. And those are some of the most important things that we can do. And to know sometimes people will be closed off from the truth. They will not accept that word of truth, that word of eternal life. That word of truth, I think, was closed off very quickly and very definitively in the last couple of weeks in New York legislature. I'm sure most of you are aware of what the legislature in New York, the state of New York, did in passing a new bill regarding availability of abortion. It is a tragic, it is a scandalous, it is an inhuman law that was enacted in New York. And it's being presented and touted as an ideal for others as well. Unfortunately, the so-called so Catholic governor was exultant with this particular law and this particular law does terrible things. It talks about the right of abortion up to the very moment before birth. Very moment before birth, abortion can be done. And if a child is supposed to be aborted but comes out alive, the doctor has no legal responsibility to care for that child. Can let it die. It's really legalizing infanticide. It's subjecting the unborn to inhuman pain and suffering. This is going to sound strong, but I believe it firmly. We wouldn't allow those things to be done to dogs. There would be a hue and a cry. The pain that is inflicted upon the unborn through that terrible wrong, that terrible reality of abortion. What, a, what has our society become? I remember when I was studying history, they used to talk about the old Romans, the pagan Romans used to do infanticide. And, and you know, the, our American culture said, oh, no way. You know, would that ever happen? No, we're embracing infanticide. At least we're being encouraged to. But in the midst of that, we must speak the truth with love. We must speak the reality. 
There has been so much deception around the whole abortion message. So much deception about it. what is it really about. You know, this was started years ago, way back in the 30s, with Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood, and she was an absolute eugenicist, which means she wanted to really do away with the lower classes. She wanted to do away with minorities. She wanted a purer race. She wanted to do away with those that were physically or mentally challenged. And that was the scope of her work. That's what she was about. And that is what has been so often incorporated into the attitudes. And the Roe v. Wade decision, what deception and false information was put forward in that Supreme Court decision. If you read back through that, it, there's so much deception that is there. So many lies were told. They didn't even look at true science. They didn't look at the basics of biology. You know, the theme became, you know, my body, my rights. And yes, that, that's not a bad little theme. But once conception is place, taking place, it's two bodies and two rights. And the fundamental right is the right to life, much more than the right to privacy. For over 200 years, you know, our legal system protected the unborn, recognizing their dignity and their worth. And then in Roe v. Wade, in Roe v. Bolton, they rejected that. They rejected it and said, no longer is that worthwhile. And it was based upon poor science. It was based upon many lies. It was based upon false information. And it really was about social engineering rather than truly even the good of women. They talk about it in terms of reproductive health. Again, a nice thing. But really, it's not about reproductive health. Half the people aborted are women. <laughs> How is it really about women's health when half of the unborn that are killed are themselves women? It's a challenging thing for us. And to realize that there is so much acceptance of this within our culture, within our society, and that we need to be more, less complacent and not be complicit in such horrendous things that are going on within our nation, within our own communities. It's so important for us to speak the truth with love, to speak the truth with the compassion, recognizing that there's many, many victims of abortion. And it's not just the unborn who are the victims of abortion. So many mothers and fathers were duped into false understanding. So many young women felt they had no other option but to choose abortion. And they did so out of fear. They did so out of, of being petrified of what might happen to them or the responsibility that would be theirs. And so there are many victims to abortion. And we need to reach out with more compassion and understanding recognizing, yes, mistakes are sometimes made, but there needs to be that healing grace. Things like Project Rachel and other efforts to bring healing to hearts and to bodies, to lives. That that is so very important. To know the compassion and the mercy of Christ. That God will forgive any sin. God will embrace the sinner with forgiving love with his merciful care. That should be the theme that we bring forth in compassion for those who have been misled or who have made bad decisions in their life. And it's important for us to celebrate all of you parents who welcome beautifully life into your hearts, into your families. I know it's not easy always to raise children, but to receive that gift of life is a precious gift of God. To recognize those words of, 
that were addressed to Jeremiah. You know, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I dedicated you. That those are not just words for Jeremiah, but therefore every, every child conceived within the womb. It's for every child there. It is for God's precious love. And you as parents so beautifully welcome life into your lives, sharing that life and nurturing it and enabling it to grow. And what a great witness you give to the beauty and the dignity of human life. We are a nation that are greatly challenged. We are individuals who are subject to the attitudes of our cultures. But more importantly, we are called to know the truth, the truth that is scientifically true as well as morally true, the truth that should be legally true, and that is that each and every human person, each and every human being, from natural conception to natural death, is precious, is sacred, belonging to our God.